Can you make your way to Mark chapter 16, please? Mark chapter 16. Today is a <clears throat> special day because we are, uh, we are finishing the gospel of Mark today. We're finishing this uh, book. And, you know, it's the shortest gospel, but it took me a long time to get through it. I didn't realize this. Um, I thought, you know, I, was, I had been teaching this book for at least six or seven months. But apparently when I was checking the, uh, the YouTube um, history file, uh, I started teaching this, uh, the first chapter of this book, uh, the first Sunday of, of 2018. I was like, wow, we've been here for a while. I know I've been absent sometimes and uh, sick and all that, so maybe that's, that's why it took me so long. <clears throat> But it's been 38 messages that we've been, including this one, 38 messages on this, uh, on this gospel. So there's a lot of content, a lot of stuff. You can always go back and, and check out. Um, one more announcement before we begin here. Um, we have a church app. We have a website as well, ccumo.com. If you ever want to check it out, it'll you know, direct you to our sermons, to our events. The church app is pretty um, handy because you get live updates. If there's a cancellation, let's say, for um, Ricky's Bible study, uh, you, you'll know it there. If, if something changes, uh, you'll know it there. It's, you just got to set up the, uh, the instant updates on your phone. So I encourage you guys, if you don't have the app, download the app so you can stay informed. If you hear something that you know you want to share, something shareable, if you will, uh, if you have uh, Instagram, Twitter, or, or Facebook, you, you can always share um, a verse or a point. Or You can always check in at Calvary Chapel Yuma. That's one way of sharing uh, you know, with others. So, if you weren't here last week, we, uh, we covered the death of Christ, the passion of Christ. We looked at um, Jesus who was crucified. We saw him beat. We saw him ridiculed. We saw him spat on and humiliated by the Romans, not just the Romans, but the Jews um, as well. One of our points last week was um, it's, it's a good deal because it was an ugly ordeal. That is, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the fact that we can benefit from the death of Jesus... The fact that it's a good deal is because somebody had to pay for it, right? So it, it's sort of, it's a good reminder because the gospel, though it, salvation is, is free through Christ, it doesn't mean it was cheap, right? Somebody had to pay for that, and that was Jesus. Something we should not ever take for granted. Another point was your effectiveness lies within your effectiveness. Your effectiveness lies within your effectiveness. That is, I cannot... You cannot be effective for Jesus and the gospel if you are not affected by Jesus and the gospel, right? If we're not intentionally in the word of God and prayer, we're not going to intentionally be living out the word of God in, in our lives. And that was one of the points that we covered uh, last week. Today, I titled the message, Woke, Woke, because we were looking at the resurrection, more specifically at how the resurrection of Jesus um, affected those that were the first witnesses of the resurrection, the fact that Jesus is alive. Not many people know this, but to be saved, you must also believe in the resurrection. Even though Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, that is, he's fulfilled the law, he's paid for our sins, the resurrection is sort of the linchpin of Christianity because it's sort of like um, God's thumbs up that everything that Jesus did and said before the resurrection is true and it's validated. That's why in passages like Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you shall be saved. So the resurrection is important to our salvation. It is essential to believe in the resurrection, and it affects us a certain way. So let's begin by opening up in a word of prayer and see what God has for us today. Father, we do thank you for your word. Help us to be here um, with purpose, with intention. Open up our hearts to it. If some of us are still sleepy Christians, if we are not awake to it, we pray that you would wake us up to your word, that you would cause a revival in us, Lord. If some, some of us are, are not born again yet, if we're not saved, I pray that you uh, would uh, tug, tug at their hearts, Lord. Don't allow them to leave this place without knowing you as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. So this story, the resurrection story, is found in other Gospels, not just in Mark, right? But I want to start it in the Gospel of Matthew. I have the verse up here. You can go uh, there yourself as well. But I want to show you this key information for the full context of what Mark is about to tell us. Matthew tells us in Matthew 28, 1 through 4, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, that is Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold... There was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven 
and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So here, Mark doesn't tell us, Mark only tells us that the stone was already rolled away when the, the women get there, right? The first witnesses. Um, but Matthew tells us who rolled the stone away. Jesus didn't need to roll the stone away. The, the, the stone was not an obstacle for Jesus to get out. Remember, Jesus was already going through, through uh, material objects with his glorified body. The stone was rolled away so we can go in and so we can see that he is not there, just as he said. So I want to say this right off the bat so you can know that God prepares in advance. He anticipates, you know, the, the, the obedience of, of believers, and he opens that door, he opens that way. Now, in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. These three ladies are the reason why we have first service. Some of you got that, right? First service people got it. Um, so they're, they're the, very first, the very first Sunday of the Lord is, is, is this one, and they're the first ones to get there. At, you know, right at dawn there, right just waiting for the sunlight to come out. This woman by the name of Salome, she was also Mary. Other gospels say call her Mary Salome. So you got three Marys coming to the, 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 the burial place of Jesus Christ, coming to anoint his body coming to counteract the decomposition process, right? They're bringing these spices to, to, to minister to the body of Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says, And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. So this was a very large stone. It took more than, you know, three women to, to be able to roll this stone. Some, some speculate that it could have been a ton or two tons. So a pretty heavy stone, but it was nothing for an angel, right? And in, in the Old Testament, we read about single angels single-handedly destroying armies. So this angel not only removed the stone, but he sat on the stone. So whoever saw the angel would see as it, this was not a, a human thing. Um, God did this. God took care of this. Verse 5 says, And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. This young man was not necessarily a man, he was an angel. The other Gospels tell us that there was actually two angels here. And they usually wear white. white and the one Gospel says dazzling white uh, robes. So he's there, and they're about to tell these women something. Verse 6, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So the stone was removed by the angels, so the angels can tell them that Jesus is not there. If the angels were not there, and the tomb was just empty, and they walked in, they would have assumed somebody stole it, maybe the Romans took it somewhere else, or the religious leaders, but that's why the messengers there, the, 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 the angels, were there to make things clear, so they could know that Jesus is truly resurrected. Remember, this is, if this is the, the garden tomb, it's interesting. I mentioned the correlation last, last week that uh, the problem all started in a garden, right? Somebody took something that they weren't supposed to take, and sin began. And now the problem ended in a garden as well, because you have the Calvary there and the garden tomb right next to it. Uh, except here, we don't see an angel with the flaming sword blocking the way so man cannot no longer come in. Here we see angels actually opening the door so man can see it that Christ has risen from the dead, dead. I think it's a beautiful uh, picture. When I went to Israel and I looked inside of the tomb, they actually put a wooden door there. Um, and when you walk inside, you can see that uh, there's a, an inscription on the door, and it's actually that verse that says, He is risen, He is not here. He is risen, He is not here. A good reminder. If I, if I remember correctly, the inscription was on the inside. It could have been on the outside, but I didn't see it till I went inside. And these ladies did not know that Jesus Christ had risen till they went inside, and that is the purpose. The stone was removed so we can go inside and see that he is not, not there. So what, what, what do the angels tell her? What is the, the important news? He says in verse 7, But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So, that, so they went out quickly 
and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were, af they were afraid. Right there where it says they said nothing to anyone, that doesn't mean that they disobeyed or were too scared to say to the disciples what they needed to say. That just means that they didn't tell anybody else about that. Their, their focus was to go and tell the ones they were told to tell. Matthew tells us, I think, I think it was Matthew who tells us that um, on their way to tell Peter and the rest, Jesus met them on the way. It says, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held them by the feet and worshipped him. So, so they do interact Jesus, but not till after they obey the word of, of the angels. Not till after. Now, this is just a side note, but I'm going to mention it for you guys that maybe or maybe you got a different Bible other than the New King James or the King James. Um, some say that the Gospel of Mark ends in chapter 16, verse 8. Okay, those are the those are the guys that you know they believe in the uh, the minority text. And maybe in your Bible, in your New King James Bible, it'll say something. The most um, the most reliable. You know, older manuscripts don't have verses 9 to 20. Don't have verses 9 to 20. Um, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with the fact that, that these, as they say, are maybe scribal notes, maybe notes that some scribe put on, added on later, because the, verses 9 to, 9 to 20 were also found in the, in the second and third century by the early church fathers. They actually quoted... If you took all the quotes from the early church fathers, you would have whole sets of Bibles, okay? Because they quoted from, uh, the, you know, the, the originals or, the, you know, copies of the originals. And, and they have verses 9 to 20 there as well. So I can't say, well, this is something that was added on much later. Not at all. This is God's word, and I just want to assure you of that. And it is consistent with the rest of Scripture. Notice what I mean in verse 9. It says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. This story is also told uh, to us in John chapter 20. So this is not new information that is being said. Verse 10 says, She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. They did not believe. Say that with me. They did not believe. They, that's, that's important uh, to note. Verse 12 says, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. This story is found in Luke 24, and it's known as, uh, you know, the, the journey to, to, uh, to, or the road to Emmaus. Again, something else found in the scriptures. Verse 13 says, And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief, and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Notice Thomas, Thomas, who we know as doubting Thomas, was not the only, was not the first one who doubted. Because the the, uh, the rest of them also they they didn't believe either till they saw Jesus face to face. That's when they believed, right? So we can't be too hard on on, on Thomas. Um, for his reaction, especially since he first missed the first Sunday. So, um, he's there. He doesn't, it doesn't say he, he congratulated them for their unbelief. He gave them a pat on the back, right? He rebuked them. Jesus rebukes his disciples for not believing in the resurrection, not believing the testimony that he truly had risen. Again, God cares about what you believe, especially when it, when it goes down to, comes down to the gospel. It says in verse 15, and he said to them, notice he rebukes him, but then he commissions them, right? Often we need a rebuke. We need that cutting of the heart with the word of God before we can go and, and bleed for Jesus, if you will, before we can go and do the word. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Not just to the people you like, not just to the conservatives, right? Jesus loves Jim Acosta too, okay? Jesus died for, for, for sinners. Jesus, you know, died for, and we need to preach the gospel to everybody, right? To every single person. So he says, go and preach the gospel to, to every creature. But first, he makes sure that they believe the gospel, which is that Jesus died, rose again as well. That's why it's good news, right? Because he's not dead. 
But you don't believe in a, in a, in a, we don't believe in a dead Jesus. We believe in a risen Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 19, we see the, I guess, the, the fuller um, Great Commission. There, Jesus tells them, you know, all authority has been given to me. And he sends them out. He tells them, you know, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit, right? Teaching them everything I have taught you. So this is basically the, the shorter version of that where Mark is saying go and essentially go and, you know, preach the gospel to everybody. And we have the baptism element as well in the next verse. What does it say? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. John uh, 3, 17 and 19 say that those that do not believe are, con are condemned already. So Jesus makes a distinction here, doesn't he, between belief and baptism. He puts the emphasis on belief for a reason because it's through belief that we are saved. And some people get confused because they, they, they see these two words married together sometimes. Well, you believe and you get baptized, right? Mark, uh, uh, I think Acts chapter 2 uh, is another verse and Mark early on as well. The idea here is that baptism should be the first work that we do after we believe. I think, you know, my, my opinion is that today in, in, in the church today, we have put baptism aside to a special day. I mean, people get saved, people believe, they are born again generally. But, you know, baptism, yeah, I'm going to wait till my family comes. I'm going to wait till I do this and that. But, you know, believing in Jesus sometimes was not, it was like people didn't know, oh, yeah, I'm going to believe in Jesus that day, right? And, and baptism happened as soon as they found the next body of water. So baptism doesn't save you. It doesn't secure salvation, but it does reflect salvation. It does say, hey, I'm serious about Jesus. I'm so serious about Jesus that I'm going to get fully submerged in water here and, and then come back up symbolically saying I'm dead and I'm alive to Christ again. That's the gospel. You identify with Jesus. That's what baptism is, really. And that's one reason why we don't baptize babies, because it would just be a bath that you're giving them. Because babies need the element of belief, right? You need to be able to understand the gospel and believe the gospel to be able to be, to be baptized, which is secondary to salvation. Nonetheless, we must not neglect baptism. What else does he tell them there in verse 17? And he says, And these signs will follow those who believe. That order is important because we have many Christians today who are following signs. No, it doesn't say signs and wonders are going to, are, or should be followed. It says the signs are going to follow them. If, if you're following Jesus, you know, Jesus is going to take care of the rest of the stuff that he needs to do to, you know, authenticate what you're saying. In the early church, they didn't have the completion of the Bible. They were writing the New Testament, okay? All, you know, these guys were writing them. They, were, they, were, they, they died for the gospel. So a lot of these apostolic gifts were seen greatly in, in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came down in Pentecost. All kinds of stuff happened. Thousands of people got saved. You know, there was times where people just touched the handkerchief of, uh, of Paul, right? And, and, and they were healed. Paul did, sometimes didn't even notice. A lot of great power during the early church. Now, as a Calvary Chapel, do we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit? We do. We do believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we believe that they are to be exercised in the context of the Holy Spirit because He's the one that enables us and equips us and, and uses us to, uh, to do those gifts. But the reality is that the power of God is in the gospel. Doesn't Romans 1.16 say that? Let's read Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. The Greek word there is dunamis, where we get our English word for dynamite. It, it, the power is in the gospel. To salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So, don't be discouraged if you can't, you know, if you don't have the gift of healing or if you can't do these, these uh, marvelous signs and wonders. If God wills for that to happen in the context of wherever you're at. I do hear stories about a lot of missionaries who are out there and they've seen a lot of this stuff. But the context is, where am I at now? Am I, am I stepping out in faith? So, what were these signs? He says, in my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink any, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It doesn't mean that we're going to pursue, hey, give me a drink of poison, let me show you, right? Hey, they, they weren't going to go um, handle snakes. But it happened within the context of them showing the love of Jesus. 
When Paul was shipwrecked in Malta and he was going to go show the Maltese people, these tribesmen, the love of Jesus by helping, by doing something simple, picking up wood and putting it in the fire, right? A snake, when he throws the wood in the fire, a snake jumps up out of the fire because of the heat and all that and, and latch, it's a viper, it latches onto his hand. The tribesmen, they're like, they've seen this before. They're like, this guy's a goner, he's dead. So they were watching to see him die and nothing happened. So God was using that as a testimony to reach these tribes. You see that? So it's within the, if it happens, it's within the context of you going out and doing um, something for the Lord. But eventually, Paul would be beheaded, right? So it's not a, you know, you're, you're, not, a, you're not immortal. Not till after you die. That's when the immortality comes, the new body. So we see these things, last two verses here, verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. This is the ascension here. The ascension of Jesus Christ. Forty days after the resurrection, Jesus ascends. It's like a mini rapture. Okay? Jesus was, was raptured up in the clouds. He was taken up to heaven bodily, just, just as he has he resurrected. He is still sitting at the right hand of God in power. What is he doing? He's, in, he's interceding for us. He pleads to the Father. He is the intercessor between God and man, it says. Verse 20 says, And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So the, the verse 20 is key. It wasn't about the signs. It was about the word of God, right? God was confirming the word of God that they were now writing presently in that time. So what can we learn from this? The first thing I want you to, to know is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an actual historical event. Jesus... Jesus is not a myth. Jesus is a historical figure. There is more written about Jesus, not just in the Bible, but in secular texts as well, than there is about different uh, entities like uh, Ro uh, Caesar and Alexander the Great. There is more content and stuff out there for Jesus, the historical Jesus, than there is other people. And the way we believe that George Washington existed, for example, is because of people that wrote about him. Witness accounts, right? And we have those. So there's no reason to say that Jesus did not exist or that he's a myth because we have witness accounts. The Bible tells us that there was five, over 500 witnesses. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul says that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep is synonymous of dying. They, uh, some have died already years after he had, uh, he had resurrected. So, science, archaeology, and even psychology is only catching up to the Bible. I read an article uh, the other day about um, scientists discovered, as far as uh, anthropology and DNA and all that, they discovered, okay, that all, you know, humankind go, go, go is, is starts off with, with one pair, with one couple. They just confirmed that scientifically. The Bible said that thousands of years ago, right? Thousands of years, it was through Adam and Eve, right? They also said something along the lines of uh, <clears throat> uh, animals and species and so on, that nine out of ten of them have one direct ancestor, giving, again, more validity to how God was able, or how Noah was able to, you know, put the animals on the ark. Because you didn't need a whole strand of animal, of every type of, you know, you didn't need a chihuahua, uh, a, a, you know, yeah, all those dogs, right? You only needed one. I only know a lapsa ops. I got a lapsa ops, so terrier mix. Um, so you only needed one. And, and that's the thing, you know, science, everything is catching up. Archaeologically, all these guys are just catching up to the, to the Bible. Okay? It's accurate. It's historically accurate. And that's what Jesus wants to communicate uh, to us today, that he really rose again. So how, does, how should that affect us? How, is the resurrection just a past fact? I don't think so. I think the resurrection is not just a past fact, but a present act for you and I, something that we need to uh, do something about. If we truly believe it will appear, it should, it should change the way we live, our passions, our desires. Note that the disciples, when they believed in a dead Jesus, they were hiding, right? They were eating. That didn't stop them from eating because when Jesus uh, went in there, they were, they were eating still. But... 
because they believed that Jesus was dead, they weren't at being active for Jesus anymore. They were discouraged. They were down. But when they found out that Jesus was alive, it changed their lives so much so that now Peter, who was denying Jesus before a servant girl, he would eventually die for Jesus later on. Why? Because it wasn't a lie. You don't die for a lie. They, they truly believe that he rose again, and it impacted their lives. And my prayer is that going over these verses is going to impact our lives as well. So the first thing I want you to jot down is wake up early. Wake up early. How, what things are going to help us to be more uh, recreational with our, our faith in the living Jesus? Well, I think we need to wake up early. And what I mean by that is that we need to be earnest about seeking Jesus first. We need to seek Jesus um, earnestly. Earnestly. The women that, that found Jesus first or discovered that the, empty tomb, that the tomb was empty, the first ones to get their marching orders were not the disciples, but the but three women that, that woke up early and they went to go serve Jesus. Granted, it was a dead Jesus that they wanted to serve, but they were still going, right? But they got to see, they got to be the first uh, witnesses. They didn't miss out because they hit snooze. Have you guys heard that saying? I think everybody here, if you snooze, you what? Lose. Lose. I was researching that, and apparently um, that came from, originated from uh, 1960s or 70s uh, um, furniture commercial, and the guy was like, yeah, if you snooze, you lose. You know, we got a deal here. You should come early. And my point, I, I borrowed from that to make the point that I have for you today. If you snooze, you lose the good news. If you, if you choose to, to put Jesus till the end of your day or, you know, squeeze Jesus somewhere in between, wherever you can fit him later on, um, it's not going to happen. I've seen... I mean, and again, I don't, I don't like to wake up early. I like to go to sleep late and wake up, you know, maybe 9, 10. But then it beats me up later on because I'm, I'm being a procrastinator. But if you wake up early, if you seek the Lord early, you're going to find them, the Bible says. That's not, those are not my words. The Bible says that. Jesus says that. He says, I love those who love me. And those that seek me early shall find me. Notice that. Those who seek me early shall find me. If you have a different translation, it might say those who seek me earnestly, early and earnestly, are, are go hand in hand here. Because that's the point. I'm going to seek Jesus early. When I, when I try to squeeze Jesus into my day, I, I have trouble doing that. It's not the same impact because I'm already affected by everything else. It's better if we seek, seek the Lord early. And I know, I know some of you guys do that very well. You wake up early, you get in your Bible, you get, you get your coffee. Before anybody, before the kids wake up, before you go to work, and you get the most out of Jesus in the day, and that's when you can soak up more of the Lord. And now you're ready. You're ready for the day. You're ready for, you know, the Lord has given you your marching orders. You're encouraged, and now you can face whatever, whatever comes your way. Levi Lusco said, Don't, stop letting life happen to you. Start happening to your life. Start happening to your life. So, so often we are very uh, reactive to things, very reactive to the things that happen. And, and it shouldn't be that way. Even though we can't expect things, we can't assume something's going to happen, we should be prepared for whatever could happen to us, right? Being ready to, to share our faith. I've, maybe some of you guys have noticed this. When you get in the Word of God, when you go to Bible study or whatever, you get a word, right? And then when you're talking to somebody the next day at work or wherever, you're like, hey, that, I just read that, that, that needs, God wants me to say that right now to this person. And, it, and, and that's how it works. It's like the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you into all truth, right? He's going to remind you of, of, of all these things, right? But in order for, for you to be reminded about something, you need to get into something, right? I need, I need to read the Word, get into the Word, and then the Holy Spirit is going to remind me of what I read. Even in Psalms, it says, Psalm 63, 1, O God, you are my God, early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. you Got to seek the Lord early. What's the other saying? The, the early bird catches the, the worm, right? And that's the thing. You know, the, the worm in our life needs to be that word, the marching orders that Jesus wants from us. It's so, it's so important. Don't you feel defeated sometimes? Sometimes I feel defeated when I wake up late. I'm like, man, I, I should have grabbed the day uh, sooner. Now I feel like, man, I'm, I feel guilty and so on. But there's grace and there's mercy. Nonetheless, God wants your first fruits, not your leftovers. Do you know in, in the Old Testament, sometimes Christians get caught up with the, with the law. With the law. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm under the new covenant. Um, 
Am I supposed to just dismiss the law in the Old Testament? And I don't think, you know, it's there for a reason. In the Old Testament, we have practices, you know. The, the, the Jews didn't just give a tithe of their earnings. They gave a tithe of their, uh, of their um, the things that they planted, their produce, right? That's the way they, they gave. And often it was more than, than 10%. It was a tithe, not, not, just, not just of the season, but even of the Sabbath years and so on. Anyways, when you look at the Old Testament, the, way, the better way to look at it is like this. You have practices in the Old Testament, and then you have principles in the New Testament. So a lot of practices transfer over as principles in the New Testament, okay? So what you need to know, in the Old Testament, they were giving their very best. They were giving their first fruits. So you need to give God your very best, your time, your very best time, your very best energy, your very best, you know, uh, of, of your finances as well. God wants our very best, and he honors that. And, and, and that's what it is, right? Giving God the best, not the leftovers. Number two, wake others up. If I'm asleep, I'm not going to wake up anybody, right? If I don't believe that Jesus rose again, I'm not going to be, be, you know, preaching that, that Christ is resurrected. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not. So, but, but God calls us to wake others up. See, the resurrection is not just a past thing that we Christians believe. It's a present thing that we achieve. We, we do something about what we believe. Our thoughts, the way, the way, we, uh, the way we think, what we think, really influences uh, what we do um, in life. If you truly believe that Jesus rose again, that should kickstart something in your, in your heart to start living differently, just like these guys. As I said earlier, he didn't send them out. He didn't tell them the marching orders till they believed that he rose again, right? I can't effectively go do what God wants me to do if, I, if I'm not excited about the gospel, if, I'm, if I don't believe that Jesus is truly alive. Paul says to the Corinthians, hey, if Jesus did not really resurrect, we should be pitied amongst all people. I'm tired of seeing a lot of fake Christianity. It's like a pep rally when I see it. It's like, wow, this is... It's fake. It's not authentic. What are you? What are you doing? You know, I see that a lot. It, it, I don't want you know. I don't want to come up here and, and give you a rehearsed message. I think you would be able to tell. I really do. I, I don't want to, um, you know, communicate that Christianity is some commercial thing or uh, you know something that is just you know your your nugget for today. It's it Christianity is different. It's got to be you know our life. It's got to it's got to transfer over to the very essence of our being. It's not just a past thing to believe, but a present thing to achieve. And what did he want them to achieve? He said, go preach the gospel, right? To every creature. But in Matthew, he says, make disciples of all nations. What does that even mean? What does that look like? Well, number one, it doesn't end at the gospel. It doesn't end at Jesus died for you and he rose for you. Repent and believe. It doesn't end there. If you have the opportunity, don't just, have, don't just take Jesus to people bring people to Jesus, right? Don't just be a go and tell person, be a come and see person, right? Invite them to church. See if maybe God wants you to disciple that person. And discipleship happens very naturally where it can happen in the context of just having coffee and going over some scripture or inviting someone to a Bible study or to church and, communi and, and continuing to fellowship with that, uh, uh, with that person. The way I grew was through discipleship because somebody else, another Christian, invited me to his Bible study and poured out into me and 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 that's how I grew and eventually I found my, found myself serving here and serving there and God using me and here I am now and, and God's still going to use me right um, but it's the same thing with every one of us we gotta that's why it says make disciples right because disciples don't just happen you need to make disciples the Bible says women the older woman teach the younger woman sometimes what that looks like is not an older woman Physically teaching a younger woman, uh, the uh, younger woman in age. Sometimes what that looks like, in my opinion, is you can have a, a twenty-year-old, very mature twenty-year-old Christian woman that can disciple maybe a, a new believer, you know, another female who's a new believer who's older physically. But nonetheless, there needs to be discipleship in order for us to grow. It's not just a past thing we believe, but a present thing we achieve. And if you know me, you know I'm not a big evangelist. You know I'm not. I'm not, you know, excited about going over and telling a strange, total stranger about Jesus, right? When I, when I, when I get the opportunity to share my faith, I, I, um, 
often I have these uh, at least two or three reenactions of how the conversation is going to go. And, and then I think, um, okay, I'm going to say this, but then they're, they're going to have this comeback, and I don't have an answer for that comeback right now. And, and, and then this person is going to interrupt. What if they say this and that? And by the time I'm, you know, on the third or fourth reenactment, the opportunity passes me by. And there I go through the cycle of just feeling guilty because I didn't take the opportunity. And God doesn't want you, you know, God, God doesn't expect you to know everything, all right? He just expects you to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again. If you know the gospel, you know more than enough to go and share the gospel, right? If you believe it and you know it, because he doesn't say, okay, guys, he doesn't just rebuke them because they didn't believe. He tells them to go and tell the world. But he doesn't say, hey, okay, well, you know, and enlist in seminary or, you know, go to Bible college for a few years or take a few uh, semesters there and then go and share your faith. No. Our job is not to convince people. If you, if you got some, some info and you can share it, share it, but, but it's just the preaching of the gospel. If the person is going to change, they're going to change by the power of the gospel, but not, not by the power of your articulation and the, the way you, you speak. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 1. It's not just a past thing to believe, but a present thing to achieve. I have this quote from um, Ironside. Henry I- Ironside, I believe, was his uh, uh, first name. He said, Interest in missions is not an elective in God's university of grace. It is something in which every disciple is expected to major. Is expected to major. So we can do one of two things. We can dismiss it and we can say, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism, Albert. So I'm not called to do that. that, that you know, you're called to do that because you're a pastor. Or this person over here because they're, they, they do it well. No, we're all called to do it because it's, it's a great commission, right? It's, it's to every disciple. So you can be that person that dismisses it and says, that's not for me. Or you can be the person that says, yeah, that's for me. And I'm not there, but I'm going to do something about it. And that's me right there. I know I'm not Greg Laurie, but if I can get in the word enough, not get in the word enough, but be in the word to where, to where I'm, I'm uh, soaking up in it, so when the opportunity comes, I can recognize it and just, just share Jesus. Just share Jesus with the world. I think it was uh, Francis Chan. Pastor Francis Chan said this, uh, one illust- gave this one illustration one time. He said, uh, if I tell my kids to clean their room on Saturday, and I go on Monday, and their rooms are still a mess, and their excuse to me is, well, we sat down and we had a study on what it would look like for our rooms to be clean." Or, 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 if they, or, or if they said, look, Daddy, I know how to say clean room in Greek. They, he wouldn't be impressed, right? And Jesus rebuked his disciples because they didn't believe. Jesus is, feels the same way still. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but it's the same Jesus. He still wants us to believe and to go share what we believe. And what you believe is going to affect your life. It says in 1 Peter 1.3, Speaking of the effect of the resurrection, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You can have a living hope. You don't have to be down and depressed, right? You don't have to be an Eeyore Christian. You can have that living hope right now through the resurrection. The resurrection has already happened. So the living hope is there for you to take. Notice it doesn't say a barely getting by hope. It doesn't say till I fix my marriage hope. It doesn't say till I get that raise hope. It doesn't say till I get that church building I'm looking for hope, right? It, it doesn't say till life starts looking up hope. It, you know, it's, it's that hope where, where we need to be looking up to get. It's not just something we believe, but something we, we achieve. Number three, faith is, faith is caffeine. Faith is caffeine. Not literally caffeine, obviously, but... Faith wakes us up is what I'm trying to say. Faith wakes us up. Faith woke them up. Faith woke them up to the degree that they went out and they preached the gospel to even the tribesmen and natives and some were speared to death. Paul was beheaded as we know. Peter was crucified upside down. All these guys preached the gospel and, and eventually they have their appointed time to die, right? Even John, I mean, he, he was boiled alive. But he survived that, but eventually he died uh, uh, in the island of Patmos. But it affected their life to the degree that they died. I am astounded by all the comments I read when I read about the story of this young man, um, this 27-year-old guy, 
John Chow, who, who went to this island, uh, the Sentinelese um, tribe there, and he, he, he was, you know, he was, he was killed by arrows or something and buried. And I see, I, I see all kinds of, uh, even professed Christians just writing, yeah, well, this guy, you know, he's foolish. He, uh, he should have uh, prayed more or, you know, he, you need to leave those people alone and so on. And, you know, and I'm thinking, well, does this line up with the gospel? Because somebody was saying, well, why did God let him die if he was doing the right thing? And I was thinking, well, why did God let Jesus die if he was doing the right thing? You know, why did he let the disciples die, the apostles die? Because it's, it, it's bound to happen and, and, and God will, God will give you a crown for your death if that is the calling that he has in your life. Nonetheless, nobody can argue that they were affected by, by the living Jesus. It says in verse 14, He appeared to the eleven as they sat the, at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. I think, you know, they already believed in Jesus, right? As Christians, we can believe in Jesus, but we can, we can um, if we're not careful, we can cultivate a hard heart. Careful with the hard heart that can uh, result in your life. Soften that heart by the word of God through humility. What does unbelief do? I think unbelief. I think unbelief in our life can can cause us to um, to believe the lies of the enemy. I think it goes back to what you think. Remember, I told you at the beginning that you know uh, archaeology, history, science—it's only catching up to the Bible. Psychology, you know, psychology borrows a lot from the Bible as well. They do. They borrow a lot and they 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 use their own terms. But. And I say that because I'm not trying to preach psychology to you. I'm just trying to preach the Bible to you, and I'll show you the verses. But it has a lot to do with your mind. It's what you think. That's why Romans 12, 2 says, you know, do not be transformed. You know, do, do not fit into this world. Excuse me, do not, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? It happens up here. It needs to happen up here for it to, to affect our hands and our feet and our mouths. We need to meditate on the word. Meditate so you can navigate if you want something to write down. Meditate to navigate. When I don't believe, have you ever met somebody, or maybe this is you, you know, you're very pessimistic. You see, you know, you, you see the cup almost empty, half empty instead of half full, right? And you know that people like that, they never really go farther or as far as God wanted them to because they, already, they were already preparing for, for defeat. Often we prepare for defeat instead of preparing for, for a win, for a victory. So what you believe affects how you behave, right? If I believe that Jesus has a plan for my life, that yeah, you know what, I, could, I know, you know, you can believe you stink and that God doesn't love you, or you can believe, you can know you stink and that God loves you anyway and he's going to use you because it's not about you, right? It's about God. And, th and that's how it is. When you start believing and I'm telling you because for the past five, six months, you know, I've been, I've been discouraged because I've been placing my, and, it, and it's just barely now, the past weeks that I've been getting, getting encouraged and, and excited. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll start writing my devotion, my yearly devotions again. But, but the point is this, it's like we, we need to, we are our own coach. You can coach yourself, you can coach you or reproach you. You can be the person that believes the lies of the enemy, that, you, that yeah, God doesn't have a plan for your life. You're not going to achieve anything. Your marriage is going to stay like that. You just find somebody else. You can be that person and be affected by those thoughts and those thoughts become actions. Or you can be the person that says, God has a plan for my life. He died for me. He rose again. And even though, you know, I can, I'm a zero, I can be a hero, just like he told uh, Gideon, right? Gideon wasn't being a hero by any measure. But the Lord, the angel of the Lord says, hey, you mighty man of valor. And then he gave him marching orders. And that's you and I. You and I are mighty men and women of valor. God wants you to go out there, but you got to believe it, right? If you don't believe it, 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 it it's not going to go anywhere. God cannot do anything with your unbelief. If you believe, then you got places to go. These guys were affected by the resurrected. You can coach you or reproach you. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good rapport, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, right? You got to think about these. We got to think about these godly, these good things. Meditate on the word. Meditate on, on good, solid worship music, right? These things are going to help us to go out. And it's like the gasoline that we need sometimes, right? Our thoughts are dangerous. 
but you get to choose if your thought is going to be dangerous to the enemy or to you, right? Joshua 1.8 says, study this book of instruction continually and what? Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Was Joshua stepping out to be a, a missionary? Was Joshua stepping out to be a pastor? No. He, he was stepping out to go fight wars, to cut giants' heads off. All right? Either way, he needed to be in the Word, and he needed to meditate on the Word to have the success in whatever arena God had him, right? And that's what I'm saying. You can be a barista, you can be a, a doctor, a housewife, unemployed, whatever. Everybody has a platform, and we need to excel in the platform that God has us. Whatever environment you find yourself in, that's where God has you for a reason, and you need to excel to the, you know, you, you see the weapons that, are, that you have. But it, it's not going to happen if, you're not, if I'm not in the Word of God, right? I need to be in the Word of God. Because if I don't win the battle here, I've already lost the war outside in my feet. You either coach you or reproach you. Number four, and while I'm reading number four, can I have the ushers pass out the communion element? Number four I titled, God Moves Things. God Moves Things. Remember at the beginning of this passage, we saw these women, they, you know, they prepared themselves to go minister to Jesus. They didn't have all the answers. They didn't know how the stone was going to be moved, but they went anyway. And they found out that the stone was already removed. God took care of moving the obstacle so they can take care of doing what they were going to do for Jesus. I believe firmly that if you prepare yourself to, to do what you can for Jesus... God is going to open the way when you step out in faith to, to remove the obstacle, whatever that is. We all have our own obstacles, but we're not going to see the stone removed till we step out in faith. Prayer is never a substitution for obedience. Somebody said, um, don't ask God to guide your footsteps if you're not willing to take a step to move, to move forward. This came to me when I was uh, back there. I wish I would have made a slide for it, but I'm going to share it with you guys for you note takers. God has already opened the tomb. I just need to open my mouth. God has already opened the tomb. I just need to open my mouth. If I've been affected by the gospel, by the cross, by the resurrection, all I got to do is open my mouth and God is going to do the rest. He's going to defeat the obstacles. He's going to move them. God moves things when he sees us coming. Our point is this. When we move for God... God moves for us. God moves for us. So here's a question of application. What, what has God been asking you to, to address, to approach? What direction do you need to start taking now in your life so God can, can move that obstacle? That's why Jesus says, you know, mountains can be moved. You can say this to this mountain, be thrown into the sea, and it will be thrown, but you got to believe, right? Believe. When we move for God, God moves for us. During communion, we take time to, to examine ourselves. The reason for communion is to remind ourselves of the death of Jesus Christ. The, the bread or the cracker that we have in, in, in our hand and the, the fruit of the vine, the grape juice, are symbols of his body and, and his blood. Notice that these Physical symbols have an element to it. We're not just, you know, we're not just having a snack, right? We're not just having a religious snack. This is, this needs to be a reminder. Again, going back to the mind. I need to, I need to permeate myself with what Jesus did for me. Well, Jesus said, do this as often as you meet. And he said, this blood that is being poured out for you is the, is the blood of the new covenant being ratified for you. And he said, keep doing this till I come back. But he also said, Paul said, don't, don't do this in an unworthy manner. And what we believe that to mean is, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, don't take communion. If you don't believe it, don't be religious, right? But we do want to give you the opportunity to trust in Jesus Christ. If the Lord has spoken to you today, and you have this sorrowful conviction where you say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, I'm guilty, I want your grace, I want your mercy, I give up. You know, heaven is full of quitters. Heaven is full of quitters, people that quit trying to be good on their own, people that quit being, trying to be righteous. When you quit on yourself, Jesus can take it, come in and, and do what he needs to do. That's why it takes humility. 
If that's you this morning, I want to encourage you to trust in Jesus right where you're, are, where you're at. Just say, Lord, Lord, uh, uh, I repent of my sins. I ask that you come into my heart. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again in power on the, on the third uh, day. If you believe that prayer and you say that prayer, God is faithful to save you right where you're at because of what he's done, not what you can do. Let's take some time. Let's take about a minute or so to, to examine ourselves. If there's any sin that we've been practicing that we need to be like, Lord, here it is. I repent of it. I'm not going to allow this to, to destroy my family anymore, to destroy my, my walk with you, Lord. I'm going to repent of it here and, and give it to you. Let's, let's take this time for an examination. When Jesus partook with his disciples, he thanked the Father for the elements, and we thank you, Lord, for sending your Son to die for our sins. Jesus told his disciples before they ate the bread, he says, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Let us partake. After that, he told them, Take, drink, this is my blood which, which is shed for you. Let us partake. Lord, thank you for this reminder that we that we so desperately need, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Give us give us opportunities to to simply share Jesus uh, with others. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.